But we certainly don't think that the standard model is the end of the story. And if you come to Physics X on Friday, you'll learn you know, some extensions of it. But um, we do anticipate that no matter what ends up getting added on, at some level, gauge theory is going to be an important part of the story. So being able to be flexible and thinking about, well, if the gauge symmetry looked like this, you know, if it was these groups or acted differently on left and right, and just kind of understanding the little places where you have to tweak things in that process, um, that's an important skill if you're ever going to address the problems in the standard model. And the standard model is incomplete and it does have problems. Um, okay, so, so coming back to sort of a review of what we've gotten through. Will, did that help at all? Yeah, no, that was exactly what I was Okay, asking. okay. <laughs> but that's, that's actually going to come back in a comment that I'm going to start with here. So this is sort of where we've gotten so far, and then we're going we're gonna to take the next step today. But um, we've, we've essentially said, okay, we've, we've got three sort of uh, types of spin fields that we'll consider, spin zero fields, spin a half, and spin one. Um, the observation that I've, I've, I've made is that all matter is a, a spin a half field. So all the things that we're made of, um, uh, electrons, uh, quarks, which make up the, the protons and the neutrons, and those are mainly what we're made of, but there are more exotic things like neutrinos and taons and so forth. Those are all spin a half fields. We now know what role the, the spin one fields are playing, right? What's the role of the spin one fields, Franco? Knows we get the kinetic terms and we'll around and tap that on the other third step, right? Right, but what? Why do we introduce spin one fields? Where do they come into the story? Oh, those are the ones that uh, they like to help uh, mediate. Interactions. Yeah, we have to introduce them to localize the symmetries, right. and they in turn give us the interactions. We haven't yet learned what role spin zero fields play, but we're going to learn about that starting today, maybe finishing up uh, on Thursday. Uh, but these are roughly the, the kinds of fields we're going to encounter. We start with a free Lagrangian for a matter field and with some global symmetry, and we've seen different versions of this. And by now you've done this like, you know, four or five times in different contexts, but we take that starting point and we gauge the global symmetry. That is, we make it a local symmetry, and now you're familiar with the, the idea that to do that you introduce a new covariant derivative and when you make this step, it's important that you have to figure out how the gauge field, which you just introduced, transforms. So you have to specify a transformation rule for, for A. Otherwise, it's not, it's not invariant. Okay? And then after you've gotten your new covariant derivative with the transformation for A, you then introduce a kinetic term, like Franco was mentioning, that allows the gauge field to propagate where you get the form of F mu nu from this commutator of covariant derivatives. And then uh, we can apply this exact same prescription to different starting points, and we get different theories. So we saw explicitly that if we take our gauge group to be U1, and we let it act on Dirac fermions, then we get exactly electricity and magnetism. Okay? Um, if is that a question or a yawn? I do have a question, yes. Yeah. So oh, yeah. are you saying that are you saying <coughs> this when we add the spin one mediating field, it's a direct sum of the Lagrangians that gives you the new Lagrangian? Like what does that mean? When you add the kinetic term, you're basically introducing the proco Lagrangian to the Dirac. Yeah, you're adding you're adding a massless proco Lagrangian onto this. So, so this is the kinetic term for the spin field, spinner field. You, you introduce an interaction between the spinner field and the gauge field by modifying the derivative that, that appears on here. But at that point, the gauge field uh, is a background. There's no, there's no equation of motion which will tell you what the gauge field looks like. To get that equation of motion, you have to introduce a proca term for the gauge field. So you add this to what you've got here. And now you've got a complete Lagrangian and everything is dynamical and everything has an equation of motion. Okay. Matt. I, oh, I have okay. okay. um, um, Yes. Kind of on this topic, kind of going off what Spencer was saying a little bit. What determines when you're gauging your field? What determines whether you want to use something like lambda dot a mu or just a mu? 
Okay. Sure, sure. So, so for for U one, for U one, how many generators are there? One. There's one. Okay. So there's only one generator. In fact, you can kind of think of the generator of U one as just the the number i. Okay. But in that case, the lambda vector of generators has only got one element. Mm. There's only one generator. Moreover, you can realize U1 as multiplication by a complex number. U1 is a complex one by one matrix okay, that's, yeah. that's unitary. That means that you have one lambda and that lambda is just a number. So you don't really need to do lambda dot a mu because you've only got one lambda. So you could literally just kind of take this, this complex number and shove it into the definition of a mu. And you only have one a mu. If we look at other examples, it becomes much more complicated. So, so the answer is basically u1 is the only case where we write it a little bit differently because u1 is always, so simple. Otherwise, it's always the lambda dot. Otherwise, it's always got to be the lambda dot a mu. For example, with QCD, we took the group SU3, where now we have three by three matrices, which don't commute. And then we have to dot them with the A mu's because there's eight generators. So in general, anytime you go to multiple generators or non-abelian, you have to start sticking with this notation. Okay. Finishing out the story of QCD, if you think of SU3 on a color triplet, okay, where this is now a three component vector in color space, you can play out this exact same story and you get the strong interactions. And then we learned last time that if you think of the symmetry group of SU2 left cross U1 hypercharge acting on the left-handed doublets and in the lightest mass case that's just the electron neutrino and the electron and it's on and the right-handed singlet of the electron then you get the electroweak unified gauge theory okay but in all three of these cases we're just playing out this story it just gets a little more complicated when you have a non-abelian case or when you have this case where things are acting differently on the left and right, because then you have to break up the spinners into left and right components. Yes, Spencer. What's the difference between E and M and unified electroweak? So this was the very last thing we talked about at the end of the, um, so, so, so that's actually an interesting question. So again, the observation we made is, isn't this thing right here just the same as that? And the answer was, unfortunately, no. When we break the symmetry, and what we're going to talk about today and Thursday is the symmetry breaking, so there'll be more details there. But when we break this electroweak symmetry down to this, to get the generator of this, you actually take a linear combination of the generator of this and the generator of that. Okay? And in particular, if I label these SU2 left generators as W plus minus and WZ, zero, and I call this a generator... Uh, actually, yeah, I think I can get away with doing this. And I call this generator Y0. Then what we found was that uh, A mu and Z mu end up being, and I'm going to call that W3B gamma, so Y0. So I'm changing my notation from last time, but you guys should be able to follow this. So when we were looking at the SU2 last time, we said, oh, SU2, that's the same algebra we see in angular momentum and quantum mechanics, and we always know it's good to use like ladder operators plus and minus combinations, and then take the third component, the Z component. Well, the third, the, the ladder operators we showed actually changed the electric charge. So we ended up calling those combinations W plus and minus. And then this one actually didn't change the electric charge, so we gave it a zero to remind us that it's neutral. 
And then this doesn't change the electric charge, so we called it something neutral. We actually, I think, called this W3 last time, and, and then eventually named it B. But it, it, it's not important what the names are, because at room temperature, at the, at, at the energy scales of the room right now that we're in, this is not a good symmetry group. This is. So the question is, where is the gauge field from this in this story? And that's exactly this thing right here. This is the ENM gauge field. So the electricity and magnetism that we know and love and you've studied since Physics 200 is actually a combination of the neutral part of this and the neutral part of this. And then this combination is the Z naught boson that we use to describe the broken weak interactions, and we'll learn how to calculate that later. And then we also have the W plus and minus weak bosons. Okay. And this uh, is called the Weinberg mixing angle because Weinberg and Salam were actually the ones that worked out the structure of this uh, symmetry breaking process, which again we're going to talk about today. Um, but this is just a fixed number. You just go out and do experiments and measure it. Okay, so it, it, it's, it's just a parameter. And obviously this is a rotation matrix acting on Y0 and W0 if you look at the form of it. Okay, but um, now a, an interesting observation which ties back to what Will was originally asking was um, I started out this whole analysis last time of this symmetry by saying that, uh, oh Lord, where do, I, where do I have it written? Oh, I got it written over here. I started out by writing down what the SU2 left and the SU and the U1 hypercharge transformations look like. And I said something like this. I said, oh, SU2 left is going to be generated by, some, or, or by, it's going to be realized by a transformation which looks like this, acting on the left-handed doublets and the U1 hypercharge is going to be uh, enacted by something that looks like this. And I'll just write down the, I'll just write down how it acts on the left-handed doublet. It also acts on the right-handed singlet. But the, the thing I want to point to is that I used a G here and a G prime here. So this is similar to what I was saying earlier about U1 cross U1, or SU2 left cross, cross SU2 right. Um, these are different groups, so there's no reason why I need to take them to, be, to have the same couplings. Well, actually, if, this, if I'm claiming that this is a unification of forces, really and truthfully, these should not be independent Gs. Because it should be one electroweak interaction. There should be one thing that is governing the coupling. You shouldn't have completely independent couplings because they're not unified if they're completely independent in their strengths. Okay, so uh, uh, an additional piece of this story, which we're not gonna get into the weeds to, to, to see, is that in fact, after all is said and done, G and G prime are not independent. They are related to each other, and they are related to each other in a not necessarily intuitive way, but they at least depend on each other via something which you might expect, and that's this weak mixing angle. So at the end of the day, you can demonstrate that G sine theta w is G cosine theta w. And so there's a definite relationship between G and G prime. But just to, just to fill out this story, because eventually we're going to do calculations and we want to know what do we need to be using in our calculations, we're not going to do a lot of calculations in the unified electroweak theory, because that's not what we observe in the experiment. We observe E and M and then this broken weak interaction. So the question is, if I'm going to do calculations with these versions of the theory, what coupling should I use for this? And what coupling should I use for this? Because, I mean, couplings are going to be important in calculations because they tell you, like, how strong is this compared to that? And those couplings are, of course, derivable from these. And those expressions are that the charged boson couplings are just the same as this original G. 
which you might have guessed because these w plus and minuses just go all the way through to the end without really getting screwed up too much. And then it's actually the, uh, the photon coupling that gets weird. The photon coupling is just this g prime cosine data. It's actually this thing right here. And then the z, the z coupling is the photon coupling divided by sine theta w, cosine theta w. Okay, there, there's a lot of like little nitpicky parts to this story. All I want you to see in this is that really and truthfully, if I just gave you one of these two, g or g prime, and this weak mixing angle, that's it. All of this other stuff is determined. Again, I'm not going through where these expressions come from. I just want you to realize there is a sense in which this truly is a unification. And that observation that when you unify things, the coupling should be at least related to each other, if not the same, is going to be very important if you want to think about unifying all the forces, which is something we're going to talk about uh, possibly on Friday. Yeah, Will and then Spencer. So just trying to keep track, are W plus minus, W naught, Z naught, A mu, and Z mu all gauge fields? Yes, they're all gauge fields. If you're working with the unified electroweak symmetry, where all of these gauge fields, by the way, are massless, then you should be thinking about W plus minus, W zero, and Y zero. You, of course, do not have to think of those four. You could pick linear combinations if you want. It's just it's not going to be as obvious that this is the symmetry group if you do that. Okay. However, when you break this to just electromagnetism having a massless boson and then these being massive, and we're going to talk about that today, when you break it, you are forced to thinking of these linear combinations of the, weak, of the neutral ones. You, you still keep the W plus and minus in the story. So at, at low energies, at the energies that we're experiencing in this room, the, the gauge fields you should be thinking about are the A mu, the Z mu, and the W plus minus. It, the, by the way, these are both neutral, so you could put zeros up there to remind you of that. So Z naught and Z naught mu are the same. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. These, these, are, these all have mu's hanging out. Mm. Every, every gauge field has a lower index of mu. How does Z mu not fit into the E and M picture? Because we didn't, when we were doing E and M. It, it doesn't. E and M just uses A mu. Oh. This linear combination is part of the weak interactions. And this, this is very different than this because what we're going to find is that this Z naught boson is massive. It's huge. Whereas, of course, the photon is massless. Spencer. So is, is A naught gamma? A naught is the gauge field for electromagnetism, so it is the photon field. Okay, and then is W zero related to Z zero? Like, how? So, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so W zero and Y zero combine to give you Z zero. No. Okay. But they also combine in this way to give you A zero. Because W zero is defined as. It's one of these three. The Say again. W zero was like the z direction of the w. Sure. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is the mixing angle like an experimentally determined thing? Mm -hmm. okay. um, and the mixing angle is something which um, you, you you wouldn't expect to be able to predict for reasons that we're going to talk about on Thursday. Okay. Other questions before we press on? Holy crap. Wait, just call this a Q&A, man. It's a recitation, it ain't no lecture. Ariel. Uh, why is the W plus minus remain unchanged between the atmospheric and the atmospheric working? Well, they don't remain completely unchanged. They will acquire a mass. So they're not, they, it, but, but it's literally the W plus minus here with a mass but they don't get recombined with things from here like the, like the neutral part does. Okay. So there's nothing special about the theta w, it's just like some random angle? Mm -hmm. But I mean, again, you'll understand more of where that theta w comes in on Thursday. Other, right, I'm gonna, let's 
Okay, okay no more questions. All right, so, um, okay, so here we go. Do, 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 do. I, I, look, there, there are plenty of courses that, that just leave out electroweak unification because it's really, first of all, it's a really hard topic. It's technically difficult. Secondly, to do, it, to do like calculations that's relevant for what we see at, 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 at accelerators, you don't use electroweak unification. You use like the broken form of the theory. But you have a theorist that's teaching this class and not an experimentalist. And the theorist is like, unification, elegance, beauty. You know, and so I'm obviously going to tell you like, this is beautiful and awesome. It's, yeah, it's technical, but, but more importantly, nothing is going to motivate what we're going to talk about today and Thursday if you don't introduce the unified theory. Because it's the breaking of this that is where the Higgs mechanism comes into the standard model, which is what we're going to talk about now. Okay? All right, so here we go. And everything that I've talked about, I have been forced to introduce Carolina, Emily. The Proca Lagrangian for the spin one gauge field, but what caveat did I always have to keep in mind? Can you repeat the question? When I go through this gauging procedure, no matter which of these versions I'm doing, to let the gauge field propagate, I use these I introduce a spin one field to localize the symmetry. Yes, I always had to add in a zero mass. Okay? Moreover. Caroline, now that you're back, um, <laughs> when I write things down in terms of left and right components of spinners, and I encountered that the mass term took the following form, I realized that for the unified electroweak interaction, where SU2 left acts differently on the right and the left components, what was I forced to conclude about the mass term for the matter fermions? It was, it was not invariant because if I look at this combination right here, if I do something to psi left and don't touch psi right, it's going to change. And it's doubtful that that's going to change in a way to fix it. Okay? So in addition to the fact that I was forced to have massless gauge fields for any symmetry, for this particular symmetry, I'm also forced to take all matter to be massless. All matter. Because all matter feels this interaction. Everything is forced into doublets. All the quarks, all the leptons. So we have this very big problem. With gauge theory at all, I have to have massless gauge fields. And with electroweak theory, I have to have massless matter. There's no mass allowed in the universe. And I'm pretty sure that flies in the face of experimental observation. Last time I checked, <laughs> things have mass. So the question is, where do things get mass? Okay? And the issue, or the resolution, is simply that you're not allowed to start with mass. You're not allowed to just put these terms in. But it's OK if they just kind of pop up. So let's see how that can happen. <laughs> now, I am going to spare you a lot of pain and instead of actually trying to work out the details of the Higgs mechanism in this context where it's actually appropriate in the standard model and is horrendous because this is already ugly and then if you add the Higgs mechanism to it, it's terrible, we're just going to look at the Higgs mechanism in a very simple sort of cartoon scenario. It's got the exact same physics, but we're not going to have to mess with all of this crap. Okay? So here we go. Our starting point is going to be the Lagrangian for a complex scalar field. And maybe I'll just go ahead and write this, which we've encountered in the homework already is a better way to think about it. And I am going to, so I've got a, I've got a scalar field, Klein-Gordon-Lagrangian. It's complex, so phi 
has a real and imaginary part, which I'm just going to call by phi 1 and phi 2. Okay. To make the Lagrangian real, I should introduce the combination phi star phi. But now what I'm going to do is, um, instead of giving this scalar field a mass term, okay, I'm actually going to uh, not give it a mass term, but I'm going to give it an interaction with itself. This is a self-interaction, by the way. Notice, phi squared is phi interacting with phi. So mass terms are just quadratic interactions of fields with themselves. Okay? And I'm just going to let this field phi play with itself. And, but I'm going to let it do it in a particular way. So I'm going to give it an interaction with itself of the following form. Minus 1 half mu squared phi star phi plus 1 quarter lambda squared phi star phi quantity squared. Okay? That mu is not at all related to the mu's that you're using for indices. Right? No, no. This is just so. This is just a parameter mu. It's a constant. It 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 determines the strength of this interaction here. This quadratic interaction. Lambda is a constant which controls the strength of this quartic interaction. This is quartic because there's four total factors. Yes. Oh. Okay, for ease of mind, can we pick a different constant? <coughs> no, nope. because it's mu in my notes. <laughs> You'll be all right. <laughs> Wait, uh, yeah, you can just you're just gonna look at the quartic interactions because what motivated that? There is no motivation okay. for it at this point. It, I, it's motivated because I know where it's gonna go. <laughs> But all I want you to see is that this is a theory for phi, yeah. and it's got some self-interaction terms. Okay. Now, many of you, many of you might get kind of excited about that term. How many of you are excited about that term? Raise your hand. Yeah, that's an exciting term. Why is that term exciting? It's like the mass term. It's like the mass term, but it's the wrong sign. <laughs> Oh, oh, God. That's its technical name, wrong sign mass term. <laughs> um, this, of course, is a quartic self-interaction, which is not nearly as sexy. And then that's the usual Klein gordon uh, quadratic in the derivatives term. Uh, but let me explain to you why the wrong sign mass term is actually kind of interesting. So in order to get uh, the wrong sign mass term, um, one way that we can interpret this is to say, well, well, really what's happening is that m squared is less than 0. OK? Because then it has the right sign. But then how the hell do you have something that has m squared being less than 0? Well, remember, um, m squared should be related to e squared over c squared minus p squared. But of course, this should just be m squared. So this is less than 0. And if that's less than 0, then we can actually break this down into the following statement. Uh, gamma squared m squared v squared, which is secretly the relativistic three momentum squared, has got to be greater than gamma squared m squared c squared, uh, which is just the factor of e squared over c squared. OK? But what is this expression telling us? Yeah, it's telling us that we're going faster than the speed of light. Spencer. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> is that is that mu is that a mu in the mass? It's a mu squared. This is a mass squared. This is a mu squared. <laughs> Explain. <laughs> So, so what I'm saying is, if I wanted to try and interpret this as a mass term, okay. the only way I can make the correct interpretation is if somehow, miraculously, this thing squared, which is supposed to be the mass, is negative. Because then it has the correct sign. Because it's not the mass. <laughs> oh, look, look, it's not the mass. You'll understand where it connects to mass later on. But I don't want to call it M because it's not going to end up being a mass. But I'm saying, if I, if I try to interpret that as mass, if I try to say it's mass, then I'm led to this really silly conclusion that I'm talking about a tachyonic particle. Okay? 
But in fact, we are talking about a tachyonic particle. Oh. So, so, so the field phi with this term is actually tachyonic. But when we say tachyonic, you should not get excited like this. Tachyons aren't really things that go faster than the speed of light. This is if you force yourself into an interpretation of things in terms of particles, which would be sensible if you were taking a class in particle physics. But this is particle physics. <laughs> and in particle physics, things aren't particles. They are what? Physics. <laughs> they're, they're excitations of fields. And folks, when you, when, you, when you look at the field context, this thing has actually got a completely different and much more benign interpretation that we're going to talk about Thursday. Okay? So I just want you to be aware, even though I'm giving you something that, that ostensibly looks like this crazy, cool Star Trek Star Wars, I can't keep them straight, photon, torpedo, hyperlight, sensitive, <laughs> tachyonic thing, it's not really that interesting. But it's an integral part of the standard model. You just can't get too excited about it. You've got to interpret it correctly, which we'll do in the field context. Spencer. Is this basically like phase velocity? Or phase velocity? <coughs> no, no. Totally different thing. Totally different thing. Totally different thing. <laughs> OK, so <laughs> no, no, no. Look, I've got to get to a certain point today because i got to finish it on Thursday. And uh, OK, so, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take this thing, and first of all, we're just going to try and crank it through this story. Because if I look at it, I notice, hey, there's a symmetry there, right? What's yeah. the symmetry? Uh, SO32. SO32. <laughs> What's the symmetry I see? Uh, SO3. This is just a complex, a single complex scalar uh, uh, field. Uh, uh, U1. U1, yeah, this has got a U1 symmetry. So this has a global U1 symmetry. <coughs> okay, so that global U1 symmetry, and so if we go through our steps, that global U1 symmetry I can imagine is enacted by some e to the i theta times phi. And I'm going to write this a little bit differently than I've written it in the past. Uh, I'm going to leave the g's and all that stuff out, and then they're going to actually come in in the definition of the gauge field. So. Um, I can just multiply phi by a complex number, and then, of course, phi star just gets multiplied by the inverse of that complex number. This is an abelian symmetry, so I can just move things around left to right. I don't have to worry about order. I only have one generator, so I don't have to do a lambda dot, so this is really the simplest thing. And so then what I can do is I can gauge this. So I can now let this parameter theta depend on position, and we know that we can make this a symmetry as long as we replace the ordinary derivative with a new covariant derivative, which is defined in terms of the ordinary derivative plus a new field, which is the gauge field. Uh, the factor here is going to look a little bit different just because I did not put in a coupling here. Um, and so my new covariant derivative is going to look something like that. And this is going to be accompanied by a transformation rule for a mu, which I, which I must always supply. And it's going to take a slightly non-standard form because of my choice of where to put the couplings. But it's got the important factors, a mu minus d mu theta. These are just constants. OK? So these, Matt? You have no factors of h bar c in your original non How why do you introduce them now? You're going to understand why the factors of h bar c come in. Okay. But, but, but the, the, the important thing is, is that um, the, the h bar c and the q are, are entering here, and they're also entering here, and those two effects are going to cancel out when you get a transformation. Okay, so lastly, we want to let this thing propagate. And so we add in our usual 1 over 16 pi f mu nu, f mu nu, where f mu nu, since this is abelian, just takes the good old abelian form. And then we end up with a total Lagrangian for this complex scalar field. And now I'm just going to erase these steps and go back and write down what the total Lagrangian would look like. Okay, so. Okay, so at the end of this, 
Just gotta give myself some room to work. Oh. So our gauge field is still massless even though we're trying to stop. Yes, the gauge field is massless because we're, we want this to be a symmetry of the theory. So in the end, our gauge field is gonna look like this, and now I'm gonna write everything out kind of in detail. D mu minus IQ over H bar C A mu phi star. Um, I, I have a minus in this derivative because remember I complex conjugate the whole thing. And so uh, I, put, I changed the i to a minus i. Um, and then I'm going to have a similar factor. For phi, I don't know why I'm writing all this like this. Okay, and then I have my original potential. And notice the potential that I wrote down, or sorry, this, this interaction term that I wrote down, it's automatically invariant because it's phi star phi everywhere. There's no derivative, so even in the local form of the symmetry transformation, it's already invariant. Um, plus the one-fourth lambda squared phi star phi quantity squared, plus now my one over 16 pi f mu nu, f mu nu. Okay, so that is now my total gauge invariant Lagrangian for this complex scalar field phi under this local U1 symmetry, okay? And you are, should now be very comfortable with where all those bits came from. Now, here's the thing. When we do particle physics, we often want to focus on these things which we experience as particles. That, that is, we want to look at tiny fluctuations in the field. We're not always interested in the whole field itself. We just want to look at what a little localized excitation is doing because those are the things we experience as electrons or quarks. Okay? So you might say, well, well, how do I kind of tease out that kind of behavior from a, a Lagrangian for the entire field structure itself. Well, there's a program for this. What we do is we basically take the fields in our Lagrangian, so in this case I have an A mu field, a phi field, and a phi star field. And by the way, a phi, let me go ahead and say this so you don't get confused later. Phi is composed of two real fields, phi 1 and phi 2. They make up the real and complex parts of phi. So I could take phi 1 and phi 2 to be my two independent fields. Or I could equivalently take phi and phi star to be my independent fields. A lot of people have trouble with that because they're like, if you know phi, you automatically know phi star. It can't be independent. They can be, trust me. <laughs> it, it, you know. I can either work with phi 1 and phi 2 or phi and phi star. They're completely, uh, they're both, they're both, completely reliable sets of independent fields. So one way to, or, or the field content here is A mu phi and phi star. And then the way that we actually get localized behavior is we take each of these and we take some field configuration, which I just might call phi naught, or the, or the naught configuration for each of them. And then we look at small fluctuations in the field. And it's these things, these tiny fluctuations, that are actually going to correspond to particle-like degrees of freedom. Now you might say, well, where do we get these things? Well, we get these field configurations from solving the equations of motion from this Lagrangian, which we know how to get. They're the Euler Lagrangian. Are you raising your hand, Rochelle? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, that's exactly the same. So, so, so here's, the pro, here's the program, and I'm about to, to execute this in detail. We take the Lagrangian for the fields. We find the equations of motion. We got an equation of motion for each of these. We solve the equation of motion to get these three things. Those are the background field configurations. And then we allow the, the field to fluctuate in each case, 
We take this whole field plus fluctuation, cram it back into the Lagrangian, and that will give us the Lagrangian for the fluctuations themselves. This isn't going to make any sense until I work through a couple of examples, so let me actually just crunch through this. So the first thing I want to do is solve these equations of motion. Okay. Now, or, or sorry, I want, to, I want to find the equations of motion from this Lagrangian and then solve them. Yeah. Now, we're just going to cheat and just look for the simplest possible solution. So if I wanted to solve the equations of motion for this for the simplest possible solutions, I can just look for constant field configurations. Because if I look for constant field configurations, first of all, all of the derivative terms automatically vanish. Yeah. So really, all I'm doing is I'm extremizing a potential. To find the potential that you're extremizing, you can really just focus on this term right here. So the whole equation of motion and then solving it, if you're, if you're happy just looking for constant solutions, boils down to, if I just call this thing u of phi and phi star, it's just extremizing that potential function. Literally, d, d phi equals zero. Okay? We can, of course, do that. I'm actually going to take the derivative with respect to phi star, so we would be finding the uh, field, we would be finding the uh, condition corresponding to the equation of motion for phi star, but strangely it's going to be in terms of phi. And this is the same thing we found with the Dirac Lagrangian. We varied it with respect to psi bar to get the equation of motion for psi, and then vice versa. But if I take the derivative of this with respect to phi star, I'm just going to get minus one half mu squared phi plus one fourth lambda squared uh, phi squared phi. Uh, sorry, that'll be a half. Uh, if you're confused, this is this has got a factor of phi star squared in it, and I'm taking the derivative with respect to phi star, so that just becomes two phi star. But I let one of the phi stars combine with a phi to give me phi complex squared, and then I've got that other phi still hanging around. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is just present a solution to this. Okay, so quite literally, I can solve the equations of motion from this Lagrangian by saying a mu is zero and phi zero is zero and phi star of zero is zero. Literally, if everything is zero, the equations of motion are solved because if everything is zero, it's constant, so all the derivatives vanish. And if phi is zero, this is solved. And then if phi star is zero, the analog equation for, uh, for phi star would be solved. Okay? It's not a very interesting solution at all. But now let's see what we, what we would get from this if we took it and plugged it into this, into this construction. So now I say, okay, my new field A mu is going to be the original solution plus a small fluctuation. And then similarly for these. Okay? Yeah. If I take these fields and plug them into the original Lagrangian, what do you think the Lagrangian for my fluctuations is going to look like? The exact same. It's going to look exactly the same. Literally, the Lagrangian for a mu phi and phi star is going to have the exact same form as the Lagrangian for the fluctuations of all the fields. If you're confused, it's okay. That's not the interesting step. Does everybody understand that when I plug in a mu equals delta a mu, <laughs> yeah. that it's literally gonna just replace a mu with delta a mu everywhere, and it's the same with phi and phi star? Are we good? Okay, clearly this is not what we want to do. What is it we want to do? 
that creates the motion of the fluctuations? No. Not, not use the trivial solution. solution. We want to use a less <laughs> trivial solution. So let me, for the space, for the sake of board space, do case two, where case two is going to be a mu not a zero phi star uh, well actually let, let's just go ahead and figure out what we're going to need so let's take this thing an obvious solution is phi equals zero but there's a there's a less trivial solution one half m squared phi equals one half lambda squared phi squared phi you cancel out your one half cancel out your phi's and so you have phi squared is m squared over lambda squared Mu squared. Mu squared, sorry. Wow. That's not you. Thank you. Okay. Wow. <laughs> you know what would have helped that? <laughs> you guys are so funny. <laughs> so any phi which squares to mu squared over lambda squared also solves the equations of motion. Go ahead. I have a, I have a, the equation of motion, when you take the um, simplest solutions are constant fields. Yeah. Why does that cancel the I Q over H bar C term? Well, in my solutions, I'm taking A mu to zero. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but, but you're right. So the, the question is, is what do you mean by taking this thing to be constant? Are you taking it to be constant or covariantly constant? So, so I agree. It's, it's, not just, it's not just taking the solutions to be constant. It's taking them to be constant with the, with the foresight that I'm going to set the gauge field to zero. Okay. Okay. But, but with that in mind, if a mu is zero yep. and phi and phi star are constant, these terms vanish. Agreed. The derivative vanishes because they're constant and this term vanishes because a mu is zero. Similarly, f mu nu is just derivatives of a mu. And if a mu is zero, this is zero. Okay? So I'm going to write down a solution for this. Okay, there's, there's a whole, there's actually a circle's worth. So I can say phi star is zero, and then phi is just mu over lambda. Okay? Seems good. No, that's, that's not what I meant. Sorry. Five, 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 one zero is. I'm actually going to look at the. Hmm. Oh. oh. Yeah, I'm going to go back to uh, looking at these two components. Oh, right. Is that what that yeah, phi, phi, setting phi star to zero and setting phi to non-zero is definitely not going to make sense. Okay, But is everyone on board? Uh, I can set the, co the imaginary part to zero, let the real part be mu over lambda, and then the complex modulus squared is just mu squared over lambda squared. Okay. Now, I can take these these parts, and I can plug them back in here because again, phi star is just phi one minus i phi two, and phi is phi one plus i phi two, okay? So let's now see what our expansion looks like. My new gauge field is going to be the solution plus small fluctuations. My new phi field is going to be the, uh, yeah, phi one is going to be uh, mu over lambda plus fluctuations in phi 1, and my phi 2 field is going to be 0 plus fluctuations in phi 2. Okay, now notice the first thing here is always a constant. These pieces depend on position. The fluctuations obviously have position dependence, so that means that all of these have position dependence. Okay, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna simplify the naming here. I'm just gonna call this a mu. There's no re reason to carry around that delta. Okay, and then I'm gonna call this mu over lambda plus, and I think in the literature this is typically called eta. So eta depends on position, and then this is going to be called beta. So whenever I write beta, it's just going to reference the fluctuation in phi 2. Eta is the fluctuation in phi 1. It's just a little bit simpler because what I'm about to write is going to take a minute. Okay, so here we go. What does our Lagrangian look like if we take these 
classic or, or solutions to the equations of motion plus fluctuations, and we cram them back into the Lagrangian. Okay, and here's what we get. Oh dear God. Yeah, no, this is where you like all start whispering and you're just like, what, what, you know. <laughs> nice pants for me. Do you think there's going to be another line? <laughs> Good night, guys. We're betting on I, I just want you guys to, to, to reflect on the idea that this is the toy version. <laughs> and I want you to imagine what this would have looked like if we did it for the Unified electroweak theory. Anyway, okay. Um, we're almost there. We're so close, except I just lost my place and I have no idea what I'm doing next. Oh, dear God. Oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, hey, 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 you guys pipe down or this is going to be a homework problem? <laughs> Something to multiply a mu a mu. Something. Well, here is something multiplying a mu a mu. Don't we have a couple of those? No, actually we don't. Because these are a mu times eta, a mu times beta. Those are interactions. What about, what about the term of the... Yeah. Yeah, this is a mu a mu times a field eta. Uh, this is an interaction. These are interactions. This is an interaction of a mu, a mu with eta squared and beta squared. This is, the, this is literally a bunch of constants times eta times a mu, a mu. Okay? So what we are left with at the end of the day is a massive field, a massive scalar eta because eta has a Klein-Gordon form. Okay, with a mass term. 
Notice mu is not the mass because you have to come back and restore all the factors of C and H bar. That's why I didn't want to call it M. Okay? You have a massless scalar beta and you have a massive gauge field a mu and a bunch of interactions. Alex, you have a parentheses that you open but don't close on the second line of that. <laughs> What's going on there? Uh, this one? Yeah. It's like, it's like, no, no, it's like, no not, not, not the brace. Right you have open the... brace, open bracket, you have brace part C, open parentheses. Uh, <laughs> <they> <laughs> <don't> <laughs> in front of the Ada. Oh, here? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Okay. Nailed <laughs> I, I, I literally, I'm, I'm really not interested in everything below this line. I mean, these are, these are interactions in the standard model, but they're not going to be important. This is the important observation, okay? Now I want you to realize that at no point did we start with this Lagrangian. I did not put in by hand a mass for the gauge field. The mass for the gauge field came from looking at a particular background yeah. of the field phi. If this had been zero, we know that this mass term would not be there. So when there is something about this particular field phi taking a non-zero background value that is somehow allowing this gauge field to get mass. Okay. And by the way, if you want to make the assignments, just, just in case you want to make sure you know how the, the details work out, uh, the mass of eta is root 2 h bar over c times mu, and the mass of the gauge field ends up being 2 root pi uh, q mu over lambda c squared. Okay, that's just literally looking at this coefficient and making it be equal to that, and then teasing out what the m is. And then doing the same with the scalar field. What units does that give uh, mu? Pounds. <laughs> <laughs> now it would get, get kilograms if you actually restored everything. Mu would be units of kilograms. But, but the, the thing is, is, I hope now you appreciate why I couldn't call mu mass. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> mu. Now, if I were going to call this scalar field something, what would I call it? Higgs field? That's the Higgs. This is the Higgs field. Many of you have heard of the Higgs boson. A bosonic field is a field that has integer spin. That's 0, 1, 2, etc. Yeah. We've encountered bosons before. These gauge fields are all spin 1 bosons. But the Higgs field is a spin 0 boson. The Higgs field is the one place in the standard model where we're actually going to use the klein gordon Lagrangian. Okay? Now what I've just given to you is sort of the field version of the Higgs mechanism. What we're going to talk about next time is what in the hell any of this has to do with symmetry breaking. Because so far I haven't said anything about symmetry breaking. But I keep alluding to the fact that it's an important part of this story. So when we come back together next time, we're going to actually see how this story reflects symmetry breaking. And in the process, I will give you a very nice picture, a pictorial way to think about all of this. Because I agree, this is just nasty. And it's really, like, it's uninspiring. But once I give you the pictorial representation of what's going on, you'll, you'll have a much easier time sort of wrapping your head around it. Okay. You, yeah. So this, we found this by a perturbation, right? Just a small change in field. Yeah. Doesn't that mean there's some bound on where this is accurate since it's inherently an approximation? 
A bound on. So, yeah, because in, in perturbation theory, your small perturbation is only good for small variations of the field. And you can put some bound on how big that variation can be before your model falls apart. Is there any such bound in this theory? Uh, if it's a non trivial. Sure, point. if I collect enough of these that it becomes. I mean, look, if I take enough excitations, yeah, I mean. Yes, there is a limit to which you can apply. So, so secretly what we're doing here is the basics of perturbation theory. We're taking a known solution and then we're perturbing about that by a small fluctuation. These fluctuations have to be limited in size, otherwise any sort of uh, expansion that we might do in a small parameter is going to break down. And by, by the way, this is going to be the seed of doing Feynman calculations when we get to actually doing calculations later on. But if I take a sufficiently large fluctuation or a sufficiently large number of fluctuations together, then I create a I, I, <laughs> well, in a sense, I create an influence in the theory which is going to violate my classical solution. So what we're doing is we're we're essentially saying that these fluctuations are small enough that they don't back react sufficiently to change the underlying solution. It's exactly the same approximation you make in electricity and magnetism when you say, I got a, a set of parallel plate capacitors, they create a uniform electric field, I stick a charge in there and it does this, and you never actually think too hard about how the charge itself changes the electric field. You ignore back reaction, and that's what we're doing here. But if you let your fluctuation or collection of fluctuations get too big, then you can't ignore the back reaction, and you have to take it into account. But the good news is, is when you do particle physics, this thing is the field throughout the entire universe. This is that electron which is sitting in your hand. They're small. They're always small. Okay. All right. Uh, sorry for running over, but uh, I had to get through that. Zero. <laughs> 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 <laughs>